Habakkuk is the eighth of the 12 minor prophets, and it's the 35th book in the Old Testament. So uh, his name uh, is said to mean embrace. And Martin Luther had an interesting comment about that. And I'll read, I'll read that. Uh, the name means class for embrace. Martin Luther applied the, me the meaning of this prophet's name to the task he performed among the people of Judah. He wrote, he embraces his people and takes them to his arms. He comforts them and holds them up as one embraces a weeping child or a person to quiet it with the assurance that if God will, it shall soon be better. And that's kind of appropriate for uh, this, this book. Uh, there's another association that the name comes from an Assyrian clan, but uh, I don't know if that, that means too much. Um, this book is different. It's different. How is it different? Yeah, it's a conversation with God. It's not a conversation with God's people. The prophet has really no message to God's people, except it's coming. And really, you don't even get that until the second chapter when he's talking about the fall of Babylon. Um, my Bible study fellowship uh, book makes the following observation that in the prophet Amos, there's a warning to the people. Judgment's coming if you don't change. Hosea, judgment's coming. You can change. Some of the other minor prophets. But in this one, there is no call to repentance. Uh, and uh, there comes a point where either repentance is impossible or God's patience has run out. And uh, that's a scary place to be. Uh, Habakkuk identifies himself as a prophet. Now, there's only two of the minor prophets that identify themselves as prophets besides Habakkuk. So you have three. And that is Haggai and Zechariah. And both of them are post-exilic prophets. This identification may indicate that he was a professional prophet, that he was part of the temple or the school of the prophets, less likely in his case, a temple or court prophet, unless he was a prophet at the end of Josiah's reign. Nothing is known about his personal life. He is sometimes identified with the Shunammite son that was raised from the dead by Elisha in 2 Kings 4, 8 through 37. Um, Daniel 14, 33 through 40. Don't go looking there because you don't have it in your Bibles, most likely. Uh, Habakkuk is transported by the hair of his head by an angel to Babylon to give a meal to Daniel, who has been in the lion's den for seven days. Uh, after he killed a sacred dragon. Uh, chapter 3 
has been used to identify him with the Levites or uh, someone that is associated with the temple worship. And again, we already address the fact that it is unique in that it doesn't address the people of God or the people of Judah. It's a conversation between the prophet and God. And it's generally, it's dated uh, somewhere between, I don't know, I could go as early as 626 BC with Nabopolassar coming to power in uh, uh, Assyria and uh, the Chaldean area of Syria. Uh, Nabopolassar is the father of Nebuchadnezzar. But definitely the writing uh, takes place somewhere between 609 and 598 BC, probably, uh, during Jehoiakim's reign. Uh, in 612, Nineveh Falls, which Roger talked about last week with Prophet Nahum. In 605, there's the Battle of Carchemish. Uh, this, um, this establishes pretty much the Babylonian Empire. And then in 605, 606, you have the first invasion of Judea by Babylonians. Uh, so this places Habakkuk kind of contemporary with Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Uh, this is what is called a lament. So, if you look at the first part of chapter one, what's the problem? Huh? God's not acting fast enough. God's not acting fast enough where? He's letting the bad guys win in Judah. The descriptions of, of, of the conditions in Judah. There's violence. I cry out about it, but you will not save. You make me see wrongdoing. Look at trouble. Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. The law becomes slack. Justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. It's a corrupt society. And this is the people of God that are corrupt. And Habakkuk is asking the question, how long are you going to continue to let this go on? Why are you letting this go on? Uh, we ask the same questions today. We ask the same questions. God, look at this mess. How long? Why? Why is it happening? <laughs> and then Habakkuk has a bigger problem. God gives him an answer, and he doesn't like the answer. He doesn't like the answer. Basically, it's the Babylonians are coming.
Um, it might be interesting to note that um, verse 5 of chapter 1 is quoted in Acts 13, 41 by Paul when he is confronting the Jewish leaders. He's saying, you know, look, uh, be astonished, be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. And uh, he applies it to the message of the gospel uh, going to the Gentiles. But God says, I am rousing the Chaldeans. And notice their description. They're fierce, impetuous. They march through the breadth of the earth. They seize dwelling places not their own. Dread and fearsome are they. Their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Note those words. Their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Uh, their horses are swifter than leopards, more menacing than wolves at dusk. Their horses charge, their horsemen come far away. They fly like eagles, swift to devour. They all come for violence with faces pressing forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, of rulers they make sport. They laugh at every fortress, they heap up earth to take it. Then they sweep by like the wind. They transgress, they become guilty. Their own might is their God. Uh, it's all about them. It's all about their power. It's all about their might. Um, they are to be feared. They are to be feared. They are a dreadful <coughs> army when they start in peace. And uh, if you want to get a, uh, a sense of verse 10, go back to 2 Kings 25. Just take a look there. Uh, verse 6. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, who passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Then they put out the eyes of Zedekiah. They bound him in feathers and took him to back off. That's pretty gruesome stuff. The last sight that you have is the slaughter of your children. And then your eyes are put out. Sport of kings. Uh, so, so now we come to the second question that Habakkuk asked. And he's saying, God, how can this be? You're going to send them? To us, even though we're bad, we're not that bad. You know, we're not that bad. And then it, it continues to describe how, um, how, um, how Babylon in, uh, enslaves people and takes them into captivity in verses 15 through 17. And he asked, how long will this continue? How 
How long will this continue? How long will this continue? Chapter 2 opens with Habakkuk answering by saying, I will wait. <laughs> I will watch. And what he describes is the watch post uh, on the city wall or the watch post in a field uh, or a vineyard. And he's representing himself as a watchman who's waiting to see He's waiting to hear the answer to his complaint. So why, why Job? Yeah. In fact, there's commentaries that compare the two of Job uh, and Habakkuk, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk. Oh, and there was a crazy thing that I ran across. Sometimes it's spelled H A B B A K K U. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> He's waiting. Then in verses 2 through 19, God answers that, yeah, Babylon's going to be punished. Today. But in verses, uh, verse 2, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that runner, that a runner may read it. And basically, uh, this was a method of posting an announcement that both the Babylonians and sometimes uh, the Israelites did. And the announcement was posted. It was posted in large enough uh, print. or It wouldn't really be called print then. But, so that anybody passing by could read it and they could tell it. They could pass that message on. Now, the message that he is passing on here is Babylon's going to come to an end. Uh, you may know this, and it's just is Babylon the shortest lived empire in the world? <clears throat> Babylon still right? Yeah, I know, but as far as this 70 year period. No, they last you much longer than that. No. I know the the concept of Babylon begins in Genesis 10 and doesn't end till Revelation. <laughs> so Babylon is still with us even today. We just may not. We call it something else. We just may not recognize it as Babylon. <laughs> um, yes, yes, and the world system. So Babylon will be punished. So he is to write this message out, and notice that it will not immediately be fulfilled it will wait for its appointed time it speaks of the end and does not lie it seems to tarry wait for it it will surely come it will not delay 
Uh, Hebrews 10, 27 uses these, uh, not 10, 27, 10, 37 uses these words. Uh, Verse 36, for you need endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what, what was promised. For yet in a little while, the one who is coming will come and not delay. And then it goes on with uh, verse 38 uh, as one of the references to Habakkuk 4, uh, 2, 4. Um, but my righteous one will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back. But we are not among those who shrink back, and so are, and so are lost, but among those who have faith, and so are saved. Uh, this is something that was pointed out in my uh, uh, Bible study fellowship lecture uh, Tuesday night, there's two errors when we're studying prophecy. We either focus on the predictive to the exclusion of the contemporary, or we focus on the contemporary to the exclusion of the predictive. The words uh, in this prophecy have application to the second coming of Christ. Maybe not directly, but as applied in the New Testament, we do. Uh, this delay, this delay of judgment of sin, it will come. It will not delay. Notice verse 4. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Again, uh, that's quoted in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. And this is two ways to respond to God, either in pride and rebellion or in a sense of humility and submission the righteous live by faith they wait for God to act they trust God they believe his word They trust God. They wait. They wait. They believe his word. And in a sense, that is what faith is. Trusting God. Believing God. And when you trust God, when you believe God, he says something, and to the best of your ability, you act upon it. That's living by faith. But Habakkuk doesn't live by faith in an easy time. Okay. What's his nation facing? It's facing invasion. It's facing destruction. It's going to come to an end for a while. At least 70 years. 
Habakkuk may have even seen the king. Zedekiah's kids killed and his eyes put out. Okay. In verses uh, six through mm, verse 20, well, uh, verse 19, actually. Um, the sins of Babylon are described and these are what they're going to be condemned for. Uh, in this passage, Babylon is the, pro uh, the proud, the ones that do not submit to God, that do not live by faith. But this applies to other people as well. Uh, it even applies today. So, Babylon's destruction is coming, and verse 6, Shall not everyone taunt such people, and with mocking riddles say about them? And then it talks about uh, their sins. Number one, they're condemned for their plunder that they're mercilessly violent, verses 6 through 8. They get gain by hurting others. They forfeit their life in verses 9 through 11. They're denounced for destroying others and pride in their own achievement, verses 12 through 14. Uh, venting wrath on those who could not defend themselves, verses 15 through 17. And then in verse uh, verses 18 and 19, for their idolatry. And then verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before you. And, you know, we think of that as kind of peaceful. Right? But the situation Habakkuk is in is not peaceful. He's living in a time when the, his own people, the people of God, are violating the law to no end. God has announced that the Babylonians are coming. Habakkuk may have even lived to see the Babylonians invade. At least the first time. Maybe the second time. Maybe even the third time. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Then the book ends with a song or a prayer. And uh, so... Habakkuk is asking for God to act. He's asking for God to act in verses 1 and 2. And this, this uh, prayer or song is set to music 
It is to be part of temple worship, I think, uh, the way it's written. In the first uh, part of it, he says, <laughs> I have heard of your renown and stand in awe, O Lord of your work. Notice this verse here. In our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known. In wrath, may you remember mercy. He's pleading with God to have mercy on them even in the time of judgment. Then in verses 3 through 15, God's might is described and, you know, his actions are described in his saving of his people in the past, in his appearance at Sinai, in his liberation of them from uh, Egyptian captivity. In verse 16, Habakkuk uh, confesses his weakness. I hear and I tremble within. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones and my steps tremble beneath me. I wait quietly for the day of calamity to come upon the people who attack us. He waits. So in a sense, Habakkuk, God tells him, you know, he says, the complaint in the beginning, how long, God? Are you going to let me continue to see this in Judah? God says, I'm taking care of it. Babylonians are coming. He waits. He watches for God's answer. And then he waits for judgment on Babylon. Notice verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the Lord, in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Now, in an agrarian society, okay, if the figs don't produce, if there's no grapes on the vines, there is no olives, there's no cattle in the stalls, and no flocks in the field. Where you at? Bad spot. This is living by faith. This is the righteous live by faith. He's trusting God. He's trusting God to take care of them. He's praising God. The God of my salvation. God. The Lord is my strength. And he will make my feet like <laughs> that of the deer. And make me tread upon the heights. Um, one of the commentators I was looking at connected this with Philippians chapter 4.
Verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Uh, then in the latter part of it, down at verse 10, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. This is living by faith. It's trusting God. It's listening to God. It's obeying God, even in hard times. Uh, what are some things we can get out of this book? <coughs> the importance of living by faith. Uh, knowing that God uh, sees the bigger picture, if you will. God sees the bigger picture, and he will take care of wickedness, however that is defined. Any questions, concerns? I in, the, in this book, there's no criticism of the condemned. Right. Uh, it's all sometimes I think you get the idea that you can't. Be honest with God about your troubles and your struggles. Right. I read a book called It's called Glorious Dark. I can't remember the other name. It's a weird name. Yeah. But he talks about the lost heart of the man. Yeah. And um, that's what I should have pointed this out. Um, I should have pointed this out. This book is similar to the lament that you see in the Psalms. Um, you know, there's a problem, and, and uh, God's not acting. Habakkuk grows in his faith by this type of complaining, lament. Uh, honest conversation. Honest conversation with God. Other observations that you want to make? If not, I'm finished. <clears throat> yeah. I thought you were there in the in if you were a Jew, were the Jews better than Germans? <laughs> By my back, I think so. But six million of them died. Right. I allowed that to happen. Yeah. You had a third of the Romans, the Greeks. English, French, every nation that has risen to power, except one so far, has diminished in yep. time. In time? Germany was the world power in 1940. We probably, you see today's paper, the picture of the plane we built? Mm -hmm. There's a picture in today's paper. 500 and something million dollars, a half a billion dollars to build one plane to drop bombs is your purpose. You can hear it and say that you have trouble stealing. We're powerful. Yeah. But I also remember that you have no power except God. Yeah. One trip away. Yeah. You depend on your planes and tanks. 
No, the, the, these these guys were depending on those uh, horses and well, and that army. Israel was better than Babylon, but they were bad enough. God sent them into captivity for seventy years. Yeah, and you used somebody else to do it. Right, and then you get rid of Babylon. Yeah. So. Hmm. It's to be pondered. You know why Zedekiah was killed? I'm not killed, but his eyes were put out and his kids were killed. Yeah, his kids were killed before him. There was a reason. Something he did called taxes. Yeah, he stopped paying taxes. Right. Yeah, he stopped paying taxes to the Babylonians. <laughs> 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 